Thank you very much, Jim, for that kind of introduction. Uh, that sort of makes up for the fact that you put me after the guy who weaponized Legos. And uh, I don't really like talking after people who are into drones, because drones are pretty sweet, and we're here to talk about basically scale, right? We're here to talk about um, essentially some of the drivers you know, behind uh, you know, what has you know, let us get to where we are. The nice thing is, is that from the show of hands, most of you are familiar with who we are. I usually have to start these things off, not just explaining who Redmonk is, but what an analyst is. So we can kind of skip that part. But you know, really the, the developer message here I think is crucial because it underpins everything that I'm gonna talk about. Everything that we're gonna talk about from open source to scale and everything else is driven by all of you in the room um, who are developers. But when we look at this sort of over time, there are sort of interesting trends which even though the individual pieces may be obvious and we sort of may, in many cases, take them for granted, when you start stringing some of these pieces together, it paints a little bit of a different picture. So when we talk about scale, we really have to start at the beginning. And the difficulty is, is that if any of you have done any research on the history of software, it's really difficult to pin down what technically the beginning is. In other words, do we really count uh, Ada Lovelace's work, for example, in the 19th century? in terms of coming up with uh, algorithms for the analytical engine, which, at least conceptually, consists of software. Should we start instead in 1946, you know, when we see the first implementations of software that run hardware? Because prior to that, the hardware that was used, for example, to, to um, decrypt messages in World War II was typically, the hardware itself was reassembled uh, to complete the tasks. It wasn't necessarily uh, done the same way by software. But for our purposes, and this is interesting, it's something that a lot of us forget, is that the early days of software actually looked a lot like open source. So can I get a show of hands? How many of you in the room are familiar with the share group? OK, we have like two hands, three hands, maybe. The share group is interesting. The share group was started in 1955. Uh, it was started by a group of IBM customers. These IBM customers got together with each other. And essentially, their purpose was basically to function as a proto-user group, all right? They got together and they had customized versions of the operating systems that they ran on their IBM hardware that they shared with each other. Now, the logical question is, how the hell did they do this? And the answer is, is that in those days, software was really just an enabler, right? This isn't something necessarily that, that was not the sort of end, it was rather a means. And for IBM, who existed essentially to sell more hardware, you know, look, if it helps me sell more uh, hardware to give this source code away, fantastic. You know, that's exactly what I will do. And this is, you know, really, this is how things were for, for quite some time, right? And this is, again, something that, you know, all of us who grew up with, you know, Microsoft and Oracle, and indeed later IBM and all these big companies making software, it's something that we tend to forget, right? We tend to sort of forget that this open source thing, which we consider to be new, actually isn't that new. This is how things used to be. Now, part of this, obviously, when we talk about scale, when we talk about, uh, you know, essentially the process for moving forward, how we got to where we are, and what the role that open source played in it, we have to talk about that. We have to talk about the idea of commercial software. Now, again, very much like the origins of software itself, there's lots of different dates, lots of different companies we could point to. One of the most important, however, was in 1969, uh, IBM made the decision, and I say made loosely, they were strongly encouraged to by uh, the U.S. government, to unbundle their software, right? Because it used to be, as I said before, they wanted to sell hardware. That hardware included software necessary to run on the platform. And in 1969, they made the decision, again, using the term made the decision loosely, to unbundle it, to effectively say, okay, you can buy hardware, and you can also now buy this, you know, this software from me. This is a piece of software that we produced. It is an asset. You pay us for this separately. It's not something that's simply bundled in with the product. So this, you know, there's lots and lots of history behind this, right? We could talk about, for example, in 1980-81, you know, the rise of the PC, the creation of uh, essentially the Windows operating system uh, spurred by Microsoft, actually at IBM's expense, interestingly, which further sort of skyrocketed the value of software. So this set the trend for decades, right? This was the way that software was created. Typically when we talked about software, particularly commercial software, we were talking about software for big businesses. And in this world, the way that you, the way that you scaled, 
right? The way that you got more computing power was by buying a bigger computer. And this was the dominant model effectively for the early days of the industry. Now again, when we talk about scaling, the subtext of that conversation, of course, is the internet. And many of you, actually some of you probably know a lot more about the early days of the internet than I do. Some of you in the room probably were involved in it. But for our purposes here, let's focus on the first sort of instances of the public internet. So without going into sort of the, the uh, Tim Berners-Lee work, uh, ARPANET, and so on, in 1989, this is, as far as I can determine, the first commercial um, I, or, uh, internet service provider in the United States. There are a couple, I think, that predated it uh, in Australia. This is out of Brookline, Massachusetts. It heralded the rise of the commercial internet. Right? So these were the first steps down that path, which said, OK, this traffic that you were familiar with, this idea of scale, is going to be completely changed. And then things began to change very quickly. So we obviously have, in 1994, Amazon.com was founded, uh, initially to retail books, as everybody knows. It subsequently gone on to retail just about everything else, including compute. In 1998, we see the rise of Google. And then later in 2004, we see the rise of Facebook. Now, obviously, there's lots of different companies we could pick. These are just three examples, uh, obviously, that everybody knows. Uh, there are a lot of different things that we could talk about, but perhaps the most important is that these companies, for these companies in particular, their idea of scale was entirely different than what preceded it. That mainframe business, right, that idea of, all right, I need more compute, I'm going to buy a bigger computer, was completely out the window for a variety of reasons. And this is why some of you may have seen this on Twitter, and <laughs> the comparison may seem like a little bit of a stretch, but bear with me. So when we think about these, com these companies, right, these internet pioneers of you know, trying to scale up to meet unprecedented new demand, the analogy that springs to mind for me um, actually is New York City bacteria. So has anybody seen this, the patho map? OK, we got a couple hands. If you haven't seen it, I would I'd give you a, uh, the suggestion to check it out. Essentially, this is a research project. A bunch of researchers went out and they canvassed the New York City transit system. So they went out to subway stops, you know, sort of all over New York and the five boroughs, and they took samples. And you know, they took them from the uh, uh, handrails, floor, ceiling, the whole bit. And they came back and they basically mapped the, the amount, uh, type of pathogens, you know, all throughout this system. So they, they have all this sort of information. They map it out. You know, as you can see, you can go to, I think it's pathomap.com. Um, they'll have this. But when it gets really interesting, and this actually, you may have seen this. This you know, basically generated worldwide news. So they took all these samples that they brought back, and some of which were pretty scary. You know, they had uh, plague bacteria uh, in a couple of them. And they saw influence of environmental events. So for example, subway stops that were flooded by Katrina uh, exhibited a mi microbial environment that was very reminiscent of marine environments. So all the bacteria that came in with those floods stuck around. But the interesting thing, so when they, they go out and they map all this bacteria and they say, all right, you know, this is you know, mostly bacteria, eukaryotes, viruses, archaea, plasmids, and so on, fine, we have a handle on that. And please don't ask me to tell you what the differences are. We do have a Red Monk analyst who has a PhD in biochemistry. I am not that Red Monk analyst. But the really important thing, as you might guess from this chart, is that almost one in two of these organisms came back and were completely unknown. They had no idea what these things were. No idea, they'd never seen them before. No idea how to characterize them. So at this point, obviously, the logical question is, what the hell does this have to do with scale? What does this have to do with internet companies? And I would submit that this chart is actually pretty similar to the, essentially, the experience that Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Google, LinkedIn, all of these internet companies, Yahoo, have had, in the sense that when they scale up, some of the problems that they encountered were known. All right. All right, how do we work with operating systems? We have a lot of experience in that space. How do we work with databases? We have a lot of experience with that as well. But a huge portion of the, the problems that these companies encountered were brand new. When I was a systems integrator in the 90s, you know, we were running around working with financial institutions, among others, and the answer to scale, as I said, was buy a bigger machine, buy a bigger database, buy more storage, problem solved. 
At the same time, these companies were running around saying, those economics don't work for us. We need a totally different model. And that model, while it's going to afford us the ability to do something that there's no way we could have done before, also came with costs. And the costs were these, all these unknown problems. How do I manage tens of thousands of machines? How do I assemble the machines? How do I put them together? How do I scale this business? From a people standpoint, a resources standpoint, a power standpoint, and more, most important for all of us in the room right now, a software standpoint. How does that work? So the good news is that unknown problems result in unknown solutions. You know, to tackle something that you've never solved before, you need new solutions to the problem. And we see this in scale. Just the sort of, at its most basic element, what does this mean? Well, largely it means taking many, many machines and making them into a bigger machine. So Joe Gregorio, some of you may know, is a gentleman who works for Google. He wrote a great piece, I want to say 2004, 2005, um, about these, the prevailing assumption prior uh, to the internet, which was n equals one. Meaning that if I'm designing an operating system, a database, whatever, you know, an application runtime, I'm assuming, by and large, it's going to be single node. That's a very, very different assumption than Amazon, Facebook, Google, et cetera, have been dealt with, right? And the canonical example of this, of course, is Hadoop. You know, what is Hadoop ultimately, or certainly in its earliest incarnation, you know, what it was sort of purely MapReduce, it's about taking a big problem, breaking it up into lots of smaller problems, farming those out to lots of little machines, and getting the result back. That's really it. But it results from an entirely different approach to, all right, how do we solve the problem of scale? And obviously it's resulted in uh, open source software because it had to be created. And that's the most difficult thing for all of us to sort of remember right now is that prior to the internet, our idea of scale was one thing. Post internet, we have a totally different uh, concept of what that means. And we need, as a result of that, entirely different software. So it's almost like starting from scratch. You know, all these things that you used to be able to rely on to build a business, you have to start over. Cost is a huge concern and another huge driver for open source. It's not very hard. You don't need a PhD in economics to understand that if I'm going to be scaling to thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of machines ultimately, paying an operating system license for each one of those is just a non-starter. It just doesn't work. Likewise, you know, the hardware. So cost, again, to, you know, force these organizations to turn to open source, to turn to solutions that, you know, maybe weren't top of mind before, you know, maybe weren't exactly what everybody expected or was the standard. Cost basically forces down this path. Likewise, training. One of the questions that we get continually from organizations that are, let's say, skeptical of open source is, why would I open this? You know, what do I gain by this? If I have this, this asset, this competitively differentiated asset, what possible reason, what possible justification can you provide for me to open this up? Even disclose any details about it. And I just mentioned Hadoop, and Hadoop is a great example of this. All right? Many of you probably know the history. For those that don't, Google published two, two papers, the Google File System paper and the MapReduce paper. They didn't open source their implementation of, well, they probably wouldn't call it Hadoop. Um, but they didn't publish their implementation, but they published enough details about what they were doing such that Doug Cutting and others could get together and it's effectively recreated in the open source project that we call Hadoop. Now, why? Why would they do this? If they have this great new solution for scaling and attacking data problems and spreading them out all over you know, a large number of machines, why would you give that up? And our answer, I, maybe somebody from Google is here and is present for that decision and can contradict me, but if I'm Google, the justification is actually pretty straightforward. What's one of the big problems that every organization has? You bring in new people, how do you get them up to speed? Now, if you're Google and you have MapReduce and you know that this is a you know, nice way to attack a particular problem, you have two choices. You can keep that to yourself, never say a thing about it, and then every time you recruit a developer, the first time that they will have seen this is the day that they start working for Google. What does that do to your ramp time? 
what does that do to their time to productivity? What happens if instead you're a little open and you take some of these details, you publish them, and in a best case scenario, it ends up in Hadoop, but worst case scenario, you can expect developers to have familiarized themselves with the paper and its contents and the approach, and then the first day that they show up to work for you, at least they have some idea of what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it. So again, we see this sort of drive, this imperative, this incentive to be open, to be, in some cases, open source. And then talent. I don't need to tell any of you in the room, I'm sure, what this means. But it is funny, again, some of those skeptical organizations, we talk to them and say, okay, well, I understand some of these justifications, but you know, really, I'm, I'm still not sold. You know, why do I, why do I have, you know, why am I supposed to make some of this open? Why am I supposed to you know, contribute these things that I worked on, I built myself, have value to a public forum? And a lot of times we have to come back and remind them and say, all right, look, again, let's sort of boil this down to two choices. You're a developer. You have the opportunity to go and work on something for a company. That company will never say anything about it. It'll be essentially a black box. Nobody will ever see the work that you did. You can never talk about it. You can never publish it. You can never collaborate on it with anybody else. And that's what you're going to work on for the rest of your career. Conversely, you can go to work for an organization that has a relationship with open source. You get to collaborate with people outside your organization. You get public recognition for the work that you do. And later in your career, you can go back and point to this and say, I built that. This is something that I worked on. Now, what do you think that does for your retention, for your ability to you know, retain, you know, attract and retain talent? So we keep seeing again, and honestly, you know, we only have 13 minutes left. This is a subject, these incentives for open source, we could literally talk about all day. But the common denominator, again, across all of these drivers, all of these incentives, is being open and is being open source. This is the characteristic, the single most important unifying characteristic of every single large scale architecture we have seen. It is driven by, composed of, and continues to innovate in open source software. Now, it must be said that, as we've referred to, there are skeptics. Not everybody buys, everybody buys these arguments. There is an argument, in fact, um, I don't know if any of you have seen this piece. It's a Forbes article by a gentleman by the name of Dan Woods. And essentially, it, it, it claims, it makes a statement that, you know, really, there are some problems which are so intrinsically difficult and therefore valuable, that they'll never be open sourced. They can only be solved by proprietary companies, you know, building proprietary messages. So I don't know what your reaction to that might be. Mine, when I saw it, was this. It, I just can't, I can't make that work. As an analyst, we're trained to, you know, basically defend, in some cases, devil's advocate positions. Right, you know, on behalf of clients, on behalf of uh, customers of ours, or even just people in the community that we interface with, you know, just to try to advance the ball forward, just to try to make sure that we're all sides are being represented. I don't even know where to start with that argument, because, I mean, really, look at this. And many of you in the room are probably looking at this and saying, "Hey, I have a project that's not up here," you know, and. Absolutely true. I mean, think about it. If I want to talk about the today's scale projects, all of the myriad of pieces that go into that, I mean, I'd need 50 slides, you know, for all these logos. So if your slide, if your logo's not in here, I would tell you either it was not on my computer when I put this together, or I found it and you didn't have a white background that I, I could use to make it <laughs> handy. So get to work on that because I'm not photoshopping these damn things. So anyhow. Okay, great. Open source has driven us to scale. Open source has powered scale moving forward. Fantastic. Motherhood apple pie. What does this mean? If you're a developer, if you're a company, if you're a developer starting a company, if you're a developer working for a company, okay, fantastic. You're telling me stuff I know. What should I expect? And the most obvious is, is that open source is increasing with the default. If you're going to scale an architecture today, I would submit that it's very, very unlikely on a statistically 
uh, or on a statistical basis, that you're going to start with something other than open source. You may use proprietary components, but my bet is, is that particularly if you're going to see any kind of reasonable scale, the majority of your implementation will be open source. You know, we see this most obviously in the case of Linux, you know, which is, I, I don't know how you'd build the argument that it's not the default operating system for the cloud um, at this point. But literally every layer we could talk about, from the VM to the operating system, containers, runtimes, platforms, databases, build system, you name it. Everything that we're talking about has good, high quality, credible, open source components. And that's not likely to change. What is likely to change, and this is an interesting one, I was disappointed, uh, some of the folks in the room may know this, I have another book coming out uh, that's actually on this topic. I was hoping it was going to be out in time, not quite yet. But one of the realities here that is difficult for, for some people to, you know, particularly companies that have you know, built themselves to sell software, one of the things that's difficult for them to digest is that software is getting harder to sell. Now, in one sense, this shouldn't be that much of a surprise, right? If we go back to the chart that I was talking about that had all those logos, you know, operating system, container, build, runtime, platform, database, if there are good, high quality, open source components that are available at no cost, it sort of necessarily follows that there's going to be pressure on commercial ecosystems, no? I mean, that seems pretty straightforward to me. And yet, businesses are still struggling with this concept. You know, and I'll go back to them, I'll say, okay, you know, how many of you in the room are running Macs? Actually, less than I would have thought, <laughs> which I think speaks to this conference. The interesting thing, if you run a Mac, you know, not too long ago, right, the, the update for that operating system would run you 167, 185 uh, of today's dollars, depending on how you adjust for inflation. Today, it costs you zero. Now, I'm pretty sure it didn't get 180 times easier to write. It's just not worth what it once was. Microsoft, a company that built you know, at least half of its empire, half of its current market capitalization on the backs of its success in the operating system market, has effectively conceded that in the mobile world, it's not going to see those revenues. If it's a nine inch device or under, the license is free. Now imagine that. This is Microsoft, a company that built itself selling licenses to operating systems, coming along and saying, well, you know what, we, we can't sell that there. So we're going to move on. Still, you know, people come back to us, and certainly people like uh, the gentleman I quoted earlier will come back and say, yeah, but company A or company B and company C. And one of those companies that people come back to is Oracle. Some of you may have seen these charts. This is Oracle's software revenue from uh, the year 2000 through 2013. And they'll come back and say, look at this chart. You're out of your mind. It's easy to sell software. It's still easy to sell software. You know, we're able to keep doing this, in spite of the fact that there is open source, in spite of the fact that there's competition, this isn't an issue. And to Oracle's credit, they've done a marvelous job growing their software business in spite of you know, some, some rough economic times, you know, particularly 2008, 2009. The difficulty is, is that if you go into the numbers and actually start taking them apart, it looks a little less encouraging. So Oracle, very uniquely, makes available in its financial statements they, for every dollar they take in for software, they break it up. And they say, this is the portion that comes from the sale of a new license, and this is the portion that comes from support and maintenance. That chart looks a little different. So what you see here is that in the year 2000, just about 71 cents of every dollar that Oracle took in for software, you know, as software revenue, just about 71 cents of that came from the sale of a new license. Now, some people point to this chart and say, yeah, this is normal. You know, businesses grow, it becomes more difficult to sell you know, new licenses. This is a you know, traditional aging curve. The difficulty with that statement is, is that in the year 2000, Oracle was already 22 years old. All right, so this is not a five or 10 year old company that you know, hit a plateau. This is a company that had been around a long time, knew how to grow both organically in, in, and inorganically. And yet, when we hit 2013, anybody want to guess you know, what the number was as far as the percentage? Less than 38. I've run the numbers for 2014, they're not in this chart. Also less than 38, slight decline from the year before. So the lesson here is not that you can't make money selling software, you can. It's not that these businesses are going away, they're not. But all of you in the room, 
who are making software, as you look out to the future, as you look about, you know, towards what am I gonna do with this, you need to take this into account. You need to think about sort of outcomes. You need to think about, all right, how am I gonna monetize this moving forward? And the answer is it's gonna be different because services are a different story. It might be harder to sell software. It's not harder to sell services these days. And by services, I don't mean people. I don't mean your traditional systems integration businesses. What I'm talking about are online implementations, right? So such and such as a service, database as a service, storage as a service, compute as a service, applications as a service. Pick your term of choice. And the interesting thing is that, as we've talked about, what's the primary problem that these businesses have? Scaling. Because as it turns out, if you're doing an implementation just for your company, it's not that big a deal to scale that. If you're doing an implementation for every single user of that software in the world, that's a little bit harder. That's a very, very different scaling challenge. So what does that mean? It means, by definition, all of these companies that are trying to scale their businesses and deliver these services online are doing it using open source software. Which brings us to the last point that I want to discuss with you. And you know, frankly, for this particular audience, probably the most logical question of everything I've talked about today. So we've seen you know, the drivers that led to open source fueling you know, these scaling businesses. We've seen sort of the benefits and in some cases costs of how open source has powered these businesses moving forward and the implications it has for what, every, you know, what we knew as sort of the commercial software ecosystem. But the question, hopefully for everybody here, is what does this mean for open source? Okay, if it's harder to sell software, fine. If services are sort of an emerging sort of opportunity to monetize the software, okay. What does that mean? Is it good or is it bad for open source as a phenomenon, as a trend, as a movement? And the answer, unfortunately, you know, analysts like myself like to give you a definitive answer uh, if we can, but I can't. The answer is it's both. And it's both because on the one hand, the trends that we see you know, lead to more and more and more uh, openness on the part of organizations. So I don't have time to go into the whole classification, but we have a sort of generational chart that we use in terms of how companies view software and their willingness, therefore, to release it as an asset. And the good news is that companies sort of from Facebook forward, say 2004, have a very liberal view of software. They look at software and they say, okay, this is great. You know, we produce this, it's helpful for us, but guess what? We're gonna get more out of it if we release it than if we keep it sort of proprietary to ourselves. So that's the prevailing attitude amongst newer, emerging, modern companies. And by definition, as we've talked about, any of these companies, even the ones that aren't releasing software as open source, rely on it. Everybody does. It's really unavoidable today. So all of that is great, right? Rosy picture for open source then. More open source, more contributions from more companies. Fantastic. We can all go home, right? Except for the fact that one of the things that happens in services business, there are different characteristics. And one of the characteristics is that it becomes very, very easy to play some games. For example, if I have an open an implementation of an open source product, maybe I tweak it a little bit for my users. And therefore, I decrease your ability to transition to that open source project either hosted by yourself or hosted by another competitive party, if I want to. It's a difficult question, because the, the business on the one hand can say, well, I need to do this to meet these needs. On the flip side, what does that mean in terms of customer portability? And just as problematically, one of the things that you will see, you are seeing, you will continue to see, is essentially open source implementations of services used as, call them lost leaders. In other words, I go to a service provider, I go to a service provider for open source implementations of a database operating system platform, take a pick. And then the provider says, hey, this is great, I see that you're using these three, four, or five, whatever it is, open source services. Um, by the way, I have this really good proprietary service. So you don't have to use it, but you're here, it's really good, it works, you might as well. 
And all of a sudden, organizations find themselves in environments where they've become dependent on software that not only is not open source, but they don't even have on premise. Right? They've become dependent on an environment as opposed to a piece of software. And that is absolutely a challenge for open source. Now, from the Outlook perspective, what are the probabilities? The success of proprietary services historically has not been very good. You know, most of the initial generation of pass providers, for example, completely failed from an adoption standpoint because developers took one look at that and said, wait, you want me to use a proprietary database, proprietary schema, are you insane? I'm not doing that. So the attitude historically has been pro-open source, open source preferred, and in some cases, open source mandatory. The question is how long that remains true, and frankly, a lot of that will depend on you guys. A lot of that will depend on what you build, how you compete, and the attitude you take to market. And with that, I am, I think, about a minute over. So, cheers. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, sir. Not at all. So, uh, Stephen went through sort of